Jason Taroka. And uh, we're here in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're gonna go check out John Figueroa. He is the walking, talking dictionary of all things Hawaiian style hot rod. A lot of them are roadsters and they're channeled heavily. Rear fenders usually molded onto the bodies. My whole perspective is I think the style kind of came from um, the English cars, English sports cars that were running around that time, but there's a lot of uh, road racing kind of stuff going on here at the same time. So that they all look, they look a lot like MGs and Triumphs to me. I like can see that. Chopped down little things. Right. I met John at a, one of the last indoor car shows at the Blaisdell Arena. He and I were the only two guys looking at this roadster that was obviously a restored old car. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't, I was like literally crawling around on the ground, <laughs> checking out the rolled pans and stuff and just totally blown away. It was so nice. And um, John was just sort of standing there watching me <laughs> kind of cockroach around the car and stuff. And you know, we just finally started talking. He started throwing some information my way about who rolled those pans or you know, who may have built that car and stuff. And, and we just had a great conversation that night and I didn't see him for another maybe three years. And then ran into him at a cruise night here, a local cruise night. And I don't know, just got along since then. He's been the uh, wealth of knowledge for me too. He just has uh, an amazing brain that holds all this stuff. Because his dad was a long time hot rodder and car builder uh, from the late 40s and 50s too. So he's been in it for a long time, grew up around it. Told me about it pretty quickly. <laughs> he was pretty excited, I think. Yeah. Um, it was just a phone call thing, and I think we went, went up to go check out his garage, and you know, it was just sitting there, and he just told me the whole deal about that car, about how he'd actually sat in that thing when he was a little kid and everything, too. Um, so I'm not, I can't remember exactly how he came about, you know, getting access to that car, but yeah, he was stoked. Junior from Wahewa, Hawaii. Born and raised in Hawaii, raised, uh, raised with cars, raised with a wonderful father. Hot Rod Dad, or more of a custom man, you know. He loved he loved his custom. He was uh, just like any of the old time customs. He always had a, as long as he had a torch in his hand, he was fine. I grew up with cars. I grew up looking at all of these little pages and things like that. Everywhere we went together, it was, oh, that, 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 oh, that, look at that car, look at this car. It was like, and I, you know, a lot of people always tell me, well, you know, you're, you're too young to know about this car. Yeah, but I seen this car because my dad used to go, any, it, we went anywhere and everywhere together and until the day he died. We were inseparable. You know, we were like best friends. You'll ask anybody; they'll tell you he knows where practically every car on this rock was. Mm -hmm. You know, and customs and who owned this and who did that. And... picked that up, oh, it's going on like three years now. I don't know how many owners the car had, but it's amazingly un unchanged pretty much from when it was built. But as far as I know, in the early 50s, uh, probably I would say around 51, 52, uh, Longy Gandal had built this 32 Roadster and it was featured in the Hop Up magazine 1953. And he was already getting ready, according to the story, he was already getting ready to sell it. You know, by the time it was photographed in 53, it was already done, and, you know, driving. So it's a pretty early, yeah. early car. But that was make this car very unique was somebody took the time and they had actually hand formed the floor. And it's a, it's a sunken floor. It's it stepped in. It's actually, the floor is actually steps 
in down into the rails so the the car is channeled over the rails but yet the floor it the, the rails are completely boxed because your floor steps down and I guess being such a big big man long long he was very tall they had also opened up the the cabin area where they had eliminated the upper deck they shrank it down about a couple of inches really that pushed it all the way back up into the the top of the trunk lid the fenders are not welded to the body they're still they're bolted to the body the fender wells were completely hand formed and the fenders like I said they they, they bolt in they bolt right up the louvers are another thing that's quite unusual they I've seen cars with this size louvers they're, they're actually a, like a good three four inch louver but the louvers are also sideways towards the rear they actually go to the left and the right there Get a short row going sideways. The rear row pan was extended all the way down and rolled and the, the use of a 494 type taillights you can see there where they had actually made a little like a little perch a little extension from the body to mount the, the 49 taillights. The dashboard is filled with a, a 49 mercury speedometer and uh, it had just one oil pressure gauge and one amp gauge which is still still has the original gauges but through the years somebody added uh, an oil pressure gauge and a gas gauge of course the gas gauge never did work I'm going to make it work now this is what it looked like in 1959 in Waipao Hawaii that's the young Richard Armstrong there you see how they they had added the, the headlight bar like I was telling you and they didn't shorten the grill yet and stuff but yeah that's him that's the car these were the only pictures he had of the car and he let me borrow them and make I had to make copies real quick and get them back to him because like I said he was very sick and he wanted you know he didn't want to let stuff like that go he had got the cars from like 1958 59 and by the time he had got it well it had a, a hot rod flathead in it with three carburetors and it was a, they said it was a part and relieved engine I guess had a big cam and stuff and when they took the car apart they put they put that in a, a model they, they made a stock car out of it and uh, they went racing for a while until that got destroyed and that was, that was the end of that that thing and he uh, had the car from when he was 17 18 years old his dad purchased the car for him for him and he was a junior in high school for 650 bucks he bought it from gypsies, <laughs> of all things, you know. <laughs> Ever since, he drove it up until 1963. The reason he stopped driving it was because he got tired of being pulled over and ticketed because uh, it had welded spiders in the, in, the, in the original 32 Ford rear end. Mm -hmm. They had welded the spiders and every time he'd go around a turn, it would chirp the tires and before you know it, he was pulled over. He was getting ticketed. And he said it was getting kind of ratty anyway, the car was kind of falling apart and he had big ideas of I guess redoing it and stuff so he took it all apart and it's, it's been been apart from 1963 all the way up until 2010 when he just before he passed away I was lucky enough to to get it and one thing he did tell me was when we made the deal looking at the car I told him well does it have an engine Richard because I don't have the the engine that was in it it was a, a port and relief flathead with three carbs and high compression head. He said, I don't have that engine, but I'll give you another engine. And I'm telling him, well, you know, that, that's okay. You don't have to worry. Now, you know, I'll, I'll put, he goes, no, because I'm, I'm telling you right now, you cannot put a Chevy in this car. He goes, you, if, I'm serious, he says, if you're going to put a Chevy in this car, I'm not going to sell it to you. I said, no, no, no. What I, what I meant was that I'll, I have flatheads. I could put a flathead back in it, you know. He said, I'm, I'm serious. He said, I'm not going to sell you the car if you're going to put a share with that. Don't worry, receiver. But he said, I'll give you that 21 stud. It's a good 21 stud. So when I got it home, I pulled the heads and stuff in the pan. It's like new in there, you know. So I said, okay, we'll put this in. The original drop axle that was on the car, I think it was made by uh, Oman Motoyoshi. There was a blacksmith that used to be in town in Kakaaka side. He used to make the drop axle and it's very unique the way it's it's dropped and it's filled on the end and it's almost like the ends are a tube design the way it is it's it's concave but Richard left the, the complete front suspension it had it had these real short uh, split wishbones on the front and the original 32 rear end he had left it out in the rain all of these years 
the axle, the center part of the axle is completely Swiss cheese. So when he, he so I thought, well, where's the axle and stuff, right? I'm picking up all of the parts because the whole, the whole place was like a junkyard, right? They said, go on the outside of the garage. It's in the corner. So I had to dig through all of the plants and the bushes and stuff. And I find this stuff, the wheels are still, even the rims have rotted out. These are the side curtains for the, the channel job. You want me to put them on? Pretty easy to just tack on there. It's very un un unusual looking. Gave the frame a fast paint job and just cleaned up the engine, cleaned up the suspension, redid all of the brakes. It had, uh, it still had copper brake lines in it from front to back. That's, that's how they did it back then. Is all these copper brake lines, you know, it still was attached to the frame. So we did all of that stuff, and, but not changing really anything. But as far as the body goes, absolutely no modification. Not, not, I haven't, I think I washed it when I got it home just to get all the rat crap and stuff out of it. If he, if he didn't get sick, he would never have sold this car. No way. That, he, like I said, that, and because even when I, when I hooked up with him and I got the car and stuff with him, uh, whatever happened to your Model Rosa that you bought way back? He goes, yeah, I had that car, I bought that car when I was 13 years old. And he said, where is it? He goes, in the bushes over there. <laughs> he was still see the vines just completely covering the car. <laughs> For right now, I'm just going to put it back exactly the way I got it from, from Richard. Uh, someday I would love to return it exactly like this with bright red paint and uh, hubcaps and uh, trying to make a collection of fake sombreros that's what that that is on there uh, but for right now i'm gonna pretty much put it back um, just just the way i got it basically they say it was basically a promise to richard you know to put it back the way the way it was make sure it's you know flatted powered so that's that's what that's what my intention is going to be
buddy. <laughs> we made it. What are you doing? Stop it. How are you doing? I guess we're parking here. Are you guys here for the gay art show? Yes. The gay 90s. We come to see any? your art, gay art show. Did you bring any body paint? Yes. Okay, good. Then welcome to the club. My name is Alex Gambino. Uh, this show is our open house. It started out as our open house. Then it, it evolved into the Northern California tribute to the custom car. Uh, it's got to do with the, the builders, past, present, the owners, the artists, pinstripers, the guy that does the glass, the bodymen, the painters. Anything and everything to do with traditional style custom cars is what the show is all about. Every year we, we honor uh, different guys that have been into the trade for a real long time, like Rod Powell, Gene Winfield, Frank DeRosa Sr. Every year we feature a builder. You know that uh, the whole idea of the show is to help inspire guys to build custom cars. He <laughs> <You> really <laughs> fell hard. <laughs>
Martinez said Rob through that. Where was it? Uh, that was in the wall of his shop. He cut it out when he came here. Yeah. Big long story with that one. <laughs> I did that car in pieces. Every time that uh, there was a show, something had to be changed. The grill was put in by taps. When I got it, I changed uh, all the bumpers and the license plates there. And the first time, I, I, I think I put the pipes on it. So the first time I worked on it. And I did that back in. Seven times we changed it, or changed something. Mm -hmm. Okay, the pin, I did all the pin work around at the corners. And I don't know if you notice the high-tech lead work. I wound up putting the scoops in the, in the front pin mm -hmm. And then we put the scoops in the quarter pound. It was, it was candy blue. I had, uh, or at least three or four, Paint jobs are candy blue. The reason I put the paint away, I got tired of painting the car all over. Every time paint is full. And blue is hard to paint any of Candy blue. See it. But it was seven times that I did the work on it. And he had seven big old trophies like that. Mm -hmm. Sweet cakes. He had to have something done before we went to the show. Mm -hmm. you know. Taylor with that 48 Ford. So he put it in two shows with a Hoshi. He lost the Hoshi and never, never showed the car again. He couldn't beat it, that's all. And he had worked on it four years before, and I worked on this one two years and got all that stuff. And Taylor couldn't go in the show with him, I mean. He, he did two shows with him. He got beat every time with him, and well, Hoshi always got to stop with him. Always, uh, oh, oh, every time. Mm -hmm. He never put it in a show, he didn't get a top of I started that car in 62. No, I was on Long Beach Boulevard when I did that. And Jose uh, had, had uh, Eddie Martinez, Martinez to do the uh, poster there. Oh, I had been showed a few times before that. I have the original uh, poster in my garage over there. But Eddie, Eddie did that one too. And then he talked them into this one. Thousand dollars they paid, paid Eddie. And it was a lot of money at that time. Today it's too cheap for it. You couldn't buy the material for it. I had to strip all the paint jobs off of it. I had that old nitro seal that was all cracked on it. You had to rub it out every other month. Otherwise it would be chalky. It was still perfect. It didn't have a crack. It didn't have a pit in it. Well, that was my price package. <laughs> and he sold it to the Japanese guy, Warren, that owns it now. And Warren's had it ever since. A friend owned it. And I used to go with the shows with him, you know, to show it. He decided to get married and he needed the money for a ring. <laughs> so I took it over. It became a pretty famous car. Yeah, but in those days, you could, you could buy a 57 already fixed up for, uh, you know, for less than a grand, I would say it used to cost two, three hundred to paint your car lacquer, and now it's six, seven thousand, you know. And you can't paint it lacquer. <laughs> exactly. But uh, this is lacquer, though. I <laughs> showed it for a while, and then I got drafted, and I, uh, the clutch went out, so I didn't have to, you know, at that time, we had the money to fix it. So I stuck it in my mom's garage. By the time I got out, you know, I lost interest. Thirty some years had passed. And I decided my mom died, so I got to get the car out of the garage, towed it to Bills, and repaint and re-chrome. The tail lights on the car, was it the first time you did that? No, this is about the third time. Yeah. They had plastic... Uh, Blades. Yeah. Who brought, like this car was really popular at one time to do, and Bill started doing those tail lights. Yeah, so we got too many of them, shit. Yeah, he did a bunch, didn't he? Yeah. And this was a low mileage, fairly new car, right? When it yeah. Was 
I think it's still low miles. Yeah, it was like 30,000. Yeah, I never drove it, you know. A long time ago, I took it to everyone that was there. <laughs> Did you win a lot of trophies with it? Yeah, a lot of sweepstakes. But, you know, you put those trophies in a garage and they all deteriorate and fall apart. Mm -hmm. I had to throw them away. Fix it so I could you know, move it around. Got to re-chrome the, the wheels. Got to re-chrome everything, actually, almost. Do you plan on showing it again? Or just for yourself? Just for myself. I got to tow it there, you know. It ain't like I could drive it anywhere. I would drive this car every day. Has it always been problematic, taking it around and just having it in the way of things? Or? Well, you the, never used it as a driver. <laughs> long time ago, I did, you know. But where were you living at that time? Like, where would you, where would you be hanging out with it? Well, I was living in the El Sereno. Then. Best times you've had in this car? I guess cruising down uh, <clears throat> New Year's Eve at uh, Pasadena. It's probably in the early seventies. No, I don't build myself. Like but I got another. I got a '60 Chevy. You know, Bill Cushenberry did the front end on. You got the '60 after you had this one. No, I got a 60 before. Before. So you were starting your own custom by the time you got this one. Yeah. And then just kept this one. Tots Kotanda. He was the original. Yeah. Gets married, you know. <laughs> Priorities change. Was it was it a factory four-speed car when you got it? No. So you put the four-speed in afterwards? or? No, he did that. He did that? Yeah. How did he get the name? The oh, that's a good one. I don't know. <laughs> Came, but it was already called that when you got it? Yeah, because he's Japanese, so I guess the, the Buddhist or something, I don't know. Yeah. How many cars at that time you think had hydraulic setups like this one? This is the first one, or oh, second one. Of, these, of this era car. But there weren't that many at the time. Like, no. So it was a big deal when it come in the show to go down. And, and yeah. Like Otherwise you have to crawl under and take the springs out or, or cut the springs and, you know, ride it, you know, drive it low. As far as the reese time, when you say, I want the front end of my car done, you didn't have to tell him what you want, you kind of just made something? Yeah, because there's the designer. Because yeah. uh, Cushenberry had a 50, 59 Chevy that I really, uh, really liked, and he had the front end, you know, like, so I did my uh, <laughs> Chevy the same. His quality of work above the other guys at the time? Or? About the same, but his designs are a lot better. Yeah. It's a lowrider mentality now, you know. Mm -hmm. I see some of these lowriders, I mean, shit. They could have bought a house. What were we doing here today? Uh, we're taking out the hydraulic cylinder and then taking it over to Bill so he can rebuild it. It's neat to see it when you see it in pictures so often and then to see it complete but just deteriorated. You know? yeah. it, was, uh, it was almost like you'd look at it and thought, man, maybe we should just leave it how it is rather than try and doctor it up, but you don't want to overdo it or anything. It's cool to see it in magazines and then to see it in person. <laughs> have, you, have you always had problems with the hydraulic setup in this car, or never? No. Still under warranty or <laughs> anything like that? <laughs> so what was wrong with the cylinder? I don't know. It wasn't hooked up. Maybe that was what's wrong. Look at that kitty cat. So. What's Bill gonna do with it? Probably sit next to it for sticks for a couple weeks. Think about it. Think about it. Maybe try it out later. Yeah. This is an oddball. That's one of the first ones I had to put in. Yeah. yeah. It don't show no leak though, does it? No. That leaves the old rigs out. You got no leak or, or dent. Sometimes you'll get a dent in it. And I have to work them off. 
I used to have a die to push in these. To this one, look at this one. These are the ones that are oh, yeah. for. They, they're good ones. Mm. Oh boy. You see the. Is that tack welded? No. Now you see what what lips look like, huh? Yeah. Hydraulic lips. Oh boy. Sneaky now. This is a toughie. Okay. Hold out. Hold out.